Just minutes ago, coastal warnings along California were upgraded. Not a forecast for tomorrow, not a seasonal advisory, but a response to what is happening right now. Offshore, sensors are detecting unusually large waves moving toward the coast with long periods and high energy. On land, the first signs are already appearing. Coastal roads are being blocked, piers are closing. Traffic is being rerouted, while water levels continue to rise with each tide cycle. What is concerning is not the numbers that were just released. It is the fact that this is still not the worst case scenario. Monitoring agencies say offshore conditions continue to evolve and everything could change within the next few hours. For many coastal communities, flooding is no longer a forecast. It has become reality. And as warnings expand from the shoreline into low-lying neighborhoods, the question is no longer what is happening out at sea. It is what happens next on land and how it affects the lives of millions living very close to the water's edge. One, monster waves hit California as normal life breaks. Over the past several days, footage along the California coast has spread with the same familiar image. Unusually tall waves crashing ashore like heavy walls of water, no longer keeping a comfortable distance from people. These are not waves meant to be watched. They carry enough energy to overtop seawalls, surge into harbors, and push farther inland than residents here are used to seeing. From Mendocino down to Monterey, the National Weather Service has repeatedly upgraded warnings for high surf and coastal flooding. Many areas are now under high surf warnings, with breaking waves expected to reach 15 to 20 feet along with sneaker waves. Sudden waves that arrive without warning, powerful enough to pull anyone standing near the water straight into the ocean within seconds. Offshore, observation buoys are reporting numbers that have meteorologists pausing to double-check. The Point Arena buoy has measured waves approaching 25 feet with wave periods exceeding 18 seconds a type of long-period swell that delivers far more force than typical rough seas. These waves do not simply strike the shoreline. They send energy deep into coastal structures where people have built homes, roads, and public spaces over many decades. But what makes the situation more concerning is not happening only offshore. At Half Moon Bay, seawater has begun spilling onto Highway 1, the familiar coastal route linking small communities to the rest of the state. For hours, sections of the road disappeared underwater. Vehicles were forced to turn back. Traffic was cut off, not because of an accident, but because the ocean moved into human space. In Pacifica, waves have been crashing directly over the seawall, carrying debris, rocks, and salt water onto the ground behind it. Early reports describe small cracks and signs of structural fatigue along sections of the seawall that have already been reinforced several times in recent years. Not enough to declare a major failure, but enough for engineers to pause, observe, and question the true limits of these protections. Farther south in Santa Cruz, the consequences move beyond warnings. A section of the Santa Cruz Wharf, a historic wooden pier that has stood for more than a century and serves as a daily gathering place for walking, fishing, and community life, collapsed under the force of the waves. The entire pier was closed for safety inspections, cutting off a public space long considered central to coastal life in the area. In San Francisco, tide gauges, including the Presidio gauge, recorded water levels far above familiar benchmarks for this year, approaching some of the highest alert thresholds used in recent years. Low-lying areas were placed under flood monitoring, even as the sky showed none of the classic signs of a traditional storm. Taken one by one, these numbers are just data. A warning, a bulletin, a chart. But when they appear together, stretched along hundreds of miles of coastline, they form a much clearer signal. And that signal is not meant for the ocean. It is meant for the communities living right along its edge. For coastal residents in California, the first sign of danger is not when waves grow taller than usual. It is when a familiar road is closed, when a pier stands empty, when places that once shaped daily routines are suddenly marked with access restrictions. Waves may retreat with each tide cycle, but once roads close, piers shut down, and safety barriers go up, daily life does not reopen by the next afternoon. What is starting to concern many people is not just the waves breaking today. It is the growing sense that something familiar is slipping away. The sense that protections which worked for decades are now being pushed harder just to keep up and that with each advance of the sea, the buffer between people and the ocean grows a little thinner. This is only the first tide in a stretch of remaining winter days, and what stays behind after the water pulls back is what has many communities beginning to question how they will continue living here in the years ahead. Two, after the waves recede, daily life stalls. When the first cycle of high tide passes, the water gradually pulls back from the shoreline. For many people watching from a screen, 
That is often where the story seems to end. The waves are gone. The ocean looks calm again. But for communities living right at the water's edge, this is when things begin to feel heavier. In Santa Cruz, the familiar wooden wharf remains closed. There are no anglers, no pedestrians strolling along the deck. Shops that depend on foot traffic have posted temporary closure signs. The collapse of part of the wharf under powerful waves is not only structural damage, it means a central public space has been removed from daily life, likely for many months. In Half Moon Bay, Highway 1 has reopened, but not in the way it once operated. Barriers, warning signs, and restricted sections break the flow of travel. For local residents, the sign that things are not yet stable is not dry pavement, but the uncertainty of when the next closure might come. In Pacifica, engineers continue monitoring the seawall. Small cracks are not labeled as major damage, but they are enough to prompt restricted access behind the wall. For nearby residents, this means a familiar space suddenly becomes an area to avoid, even though just days earlier they pass through it every morning. These changes do not happen all at once, and they do not arrive like a wave. They spread gradually, one pathway blocked, one pier closed, one route avoided. Each detail may seem minor, but together they create a shared feeling many people begin to recognize. Coastal life no longer feels as predictable as it once did. For older residents, this is especially noticeable. Simple routines, a morning walk along the shore, taking grandchildren out to the pier on weekends, or sitting with a fishing rod for a few quiet hours now depend on warning signs and temporary barriers. Life does not collapse, but it enters a constant state of waiting. Local agencies shift into recovery mode. Sandbags are removed. Debris is cleared. Damage reports are prepared. Alongside those efforts are questions residents ask quietly, without official statements. If a single high tide caused this level of disruption, what happens next when winter is not yet over? Not everyone loses a home. Not everyone must evacuate. But many people begin living with the sense that what once felt stable can now change overnight. The ocean is no longer a calm backdrop to coastal life. It becomes a factor every daily decision must take into account. What spreads unease is not the scale of current damage, but the uncertainty ahead. There is no clear marker for when everything will fully return to normal. No guarantee that the recent waves were the last. Only forecasts suggesting similar conditions may return, possibly more often. The waves have receded, but barriers remain. Piers stay closed. And for many coastal communities in California, life is entering a new phase. One where stability is no longer assumed, but something that can be paused at any time. 3. California's coastal defenses are working overtime. After the waves pull back and roads begin to reopen, a familiar feeling settles in. Not relief, but waiting. Waiting for the next tide. Waiting for the next update. Waiting to see whether what was just repaired can hold through the next test. Along the California coast, the stability of daily life increasingly depends on something few people ever see, the network of monitoring and emergency response. Offshore buoys, tide gauges, coordination centers, engineers on remote watch. When everything works smoothly, most people never notice these systems. During periods of large surf, all of them operate at their highest level. Data flows in constantly from observation stations, water levels, wave periods, swell direction. Decisions are no longer planned by the day, but by the hour. When a sensor lags or a buoy stops transmitting, it is not just a technical issue. It can delay warnings, lead to later road closures, or allow people into areas that should already be restricted. During recent strong wave events, local agencies have been forced to rely on sources not designed for this role. Traffic cameras, images posted by residents, flood reports called into hotlines. The official system remains in place, but it must be patched with outside information to track conditions on the ground in real time. For residents, this is often the first time they clearly feel the gap between forecast and reality narrowing. What were once considered safety margins now need constant checking. Each new update is not just a weather report, but guidance for deciding whether to go out, whether to walk the coast, whether to take grandchildren to the pier as usual. The pressure does not fall only on coordination centers, but on the structures built to shield people from the sea. Seawalls, jetties, and wooden piers designed around wave scenarios from decades ago are now absorbing different kinds of energy. Longer swells, stronger cycles, more frequent events. What once counted as rare exceptions now appear more often. In this setting, familiar responses are activated quickly. Temporary reinforcements, restricted access, patching exposed weak points after each tide. All of these steps have clear reasons. But for residents living alongside these structures, the feeling they leave behind is no longer reassurance. It is fragility, because every time the system strains to keep things in place, people see something clearly. 
The stability of coastal life now rests not on wide safety buffers, but on rapid responses and short-term decisions. A single delay, a single misjudgment can push daily life straight into waiting and restriction. No announcement says the system has failed. No official voice declares current measures insufficient. Yet questions form naturally. If every winter requires the highest alert levels. If every wave event pushes the system close to its limit. What happens when something larger arrives or when waves no longer leave enough time to recover between them? For many coastal communities, this is the moment they begin to realize the issue is not only the ocean, it is the effort to maintain a familiar way of living using tools that must strain harder each time to keep pace. And when daily life depends on a system under constant tension, the question is no longer whether the next wave will come. It is whether there is enough safety margin left to absorb it before unseen limits are finally crossed. 4. We've seen waves before. Why this feels different? For many people living along the California coast, images of large waves are not unfamiliar. The history of this shoreline has always been tied to harsh winters, high tides, and powerful swells pushing in from the Pacific. Many older residents still remember years when the ocean roared through the night, when piers trembled and boats had to be secured tightly before nightfall. One period often mentioned is the winter of the early 1980s, when a series of strong waves struck Northern California and caused serious damage to fishing harbors and piers. Sections of piers broke apart. Boats collided in the dark. The sound of the sea, was described as a freight train running beneath the water. Yet in the end, coastal communities repaired the damage, reopened, and returned to daily life much as before. That is where the difference lies. Back then, events like these were seen as unusual. They came and went. There was enough time afterward to repair, reinforce, and regain a sense of stability. The ocean was violent, but not continuous. Coastal structures were designed with the assumption that extreme stress would occur only once in a while. Today, similar weather creates a very different feeling. The waves now are not only high in the moment, they carry energy over longer periods. Long wave cycles drive force deeper into structures, revealing weaknesses that once took many years to surface. More importantly, high tides and strong waves no longer arrive as isolated events. They overlap. They follow one another closely. They leave very little time for the shoreline and coastal infrastructure to recover. For residents, the difference is not found in the numbers on wave charts, but in everyday experience. In the past, after a major storm, repairs were made and routines resumed. Today, after the water pulls back, barriers remain. Warning signs stay in place. Talk of the next alert continues, even though winter is not yet halfway through. This leads to a difficult question. If similar waves were overcome in the past, why does the same kind of challenge now make daily life feel more fragile? Has the ocean fundamentally changed, or have the safety margins people rely on grown thinner over time? No one is saying everything is collapsing, but more people are recognizing that what used to be an exception is becoming a repeated pattern. And when extremes are no longer rare, relying on past memory for reassurance may no longer be enough. The most dangerous part of this change is not a single record-breaking wave. It is that each generation is forced to live with less room for safety than the one before it, while still trying to maintain a way of life built for a different era. 5. The costly cycle communities can't escape. After every major wave event, a familiar sequence begins. Affected areas are fenced off. Warning signs go up. Engineers survey the damage. Reports are written. On paper, these are necessary responses. In the daily lives of coastal communities, however, they gradually form a cycle that is hard to break. In towns that depend on the coastline, each pier closure is more than the loss of a structure. It means fewer visitors, quieter weekends, and lost income concentrated into a short season. Small restaurants, service shops, and local jobs cannot simply wait for repairs to finish. That gap does not disappear when the waves recede. Along coastal roads, temporary closures have also become less exceptional. Residents grow accustomed to detours. Bus routes change. Travel times increase. These small adjustments, when repeated multiple times in a season, become a new way of living. A life shaped more by warnings than by personal plans. Repairs are usually carried out as quickly as possible. Temporary reinforcement, patching weak spots, doing just enough to get through the current winter. Speed, however, is not the same as durability. Long-term solutions are often delayed by cost, procedure, or simply because no one wants to make difficult decisions while things are still working. Meanwhile, pressure on coastal structures continues to build. Each repair makes sense on its own. But over many years, residents begin to see that these fixes rarely break the cycle. They are just enough to prepare for the next disruption. The clearest impacts fall on those least able to adapt. 
Older residents cannot easily change routines. Local workers struggle to replace income when piers remain closed for long stretches. Renters have little control over how long they will live beside fences and restricted zones. For them, each repair cycle is not just an engineering issue. It is another adjustment toward a less stable life. There is no announcement declaring the current approach a failure. No single decision stands out as wrong. But as disruption becomes familiar, the question quietly shifts. It is no longer about when repairs will be finished. It becomes whether constant repair is keeping coastal communities in a prolonged state of fragility. 6. When extreme waves become the new normal. As coastal warnings along California begin to ease, the ocean gradually calms. Waves that once spilled over seawalls leave behind damp concrete and scattered debris. For many watching from afar, this is where the story ends. The ocean has done what it came to do. For communities living at the water's edge, it does not. Barriers remain. Some access points stay closed. Structures that were just inspected cannot reopen immediately. Coastal life enters another quiet phase, one where stability is no longer assumed, but depends on administrative decisions and technical assessments. What prompts reflection is not the intensity of the most recent waves, but how often warnings now appear. When events once considered rare become frequent, life is no longer organized around long calm seasons, but around the gaps between disruptions. Forecasts suggest that conditions producing large waves and high tides may continue in the months ahead, even in the years ahead, not as a single continuous disaster, but as a series of events requiring gradual adjustment. Each adjustment brings a small change in how people live, move, and use shared spaces. This raises a difficult question. If current measures are enough to keep things standing in the short term, what is the long-term cost of holding on to the same way of life? And if stability must now be built from a chain of temporary fixes, is it still stability or simply prolonged endurance? No one denies that the coast remains central to life in California, but more people are beginning to see that the relationship between people and the ocean is entering a new phase, one where safety comes not from habit but from continuous adaptation. The waves will come again, and they will recede. The question that remains does not belong to the ocean. It belongs to how we choose to live in the quiet space between two waves, and whether that space is still long enough to keep life standing as it once did. Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.